Welcome to Black Led Day at the Up and Coming Food Co-op Conference 2021. Uh, many of you have become familiar with the National Black Food and Justice Alliance through our work of organizing Black Food Co-op operators at the Up and Coming Food Conference, Up and Coming Food Co-op Conference over the past three years. Uh, but that work is really an outgrowth of some larger work the National Black Food and Justice Alliance has been doing. And um, that, that work started actually in Jackson, Mississippi. So we're gonna talk about the history of that work and also uh, talk about where that work is now. We're very pleased to be leading Black Food Co-op Day at the up and coming Food Co-op Conference and to be in partnership with the Food Co-op Alliance. In fact, this is just one part of the partnership with the Food Co-op Alliance. We also, excuse me, the Food Co-op Initiative. We also jointly sponsor bi-monthly peer calls and quarterly webinars for Black co-op operators. And then the shaping of space for Black food co-op operators within the up and coming food co-op conference is another part of this partnership. Um, today, we wanna place the work of organizing Black food co-op operators within the larger context of building Black food sovereignty that the National Black Food and Justice Alliance is engaged in. And we are so pleased to have as my co-presenter today, the executive director and co-founder of the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, the mighty, mighty, mighty Dara <laughs> Cooper. What up, though? What up, though? You too kind. You too kind. I'm excited for this convo. So I'm, I'm always happy to be in conversation with you. So uh, many of the folks who have attended the Up and Coming Conference over the last few years are familiar with me. They might not be familiar with you. So why don't we start with who is Dara Cooper? <laughs> um, well, I'll start by saying I am the daughter of a long lineage of troublemakers, good troublemakers, freedom fighters, um, the daughter of Ia Ifalolo Mobola, Vernestine Perry, Ibarra Tarun, a long lineage of folks who, um, you know, believe that our people have the right, the means, uh, the wherewithal, the magic to create the destinies that our communities deserve. And so uh, I personally have come up in a long lineage of freedom fighters from the anti-apartheid movement to uh, the movement to in solidarity with IAT to political prisoners and exiles. So my roots are deep in the black liberation struggle and the larger inter international struggle towards freedom, uh, liberation, um, and you know, dignity for our communities. And so I'm really excited and honored to be able to do the work that I do uh, in service and in, in comradeship with uh, an amazing um, alliance of leaders and organizations working towards food sovereignty uh, and land justice. A couple of notes, uh, just so folks know a little bit more about myself uh, professionally or organizationally. Um, I used to run a mobile market in Chicago called Fresh Moves. It's now, I would say, the longest running um, <clears throat> mobile market in the country. It's now um, run by Urban Growers Collective in Chicago. But uh, Fresh Moves uh, was where I, I would say, cut my teeth in the food justice movement. Um, also cut my teeth in the food justice movement with the Healthy Food Hub in Chicago, sponsored by the Black Oak Center for Sustainable Renewable Living. Um, and then after that, I had the um, great privilege of working with comrades in Brooklyn, New York, um, with the Food and Fitness Partnership, launching a food a um, farm to preschool uh, work and a Black farmers market there, and a healthy corner store and a healthy supermarket, and so just done a lot of work, um, mostly around the distribution um, of healthy food to our communities um, and control of food in our communities, which leads me to this incredible, um, exciting work that's happening amongst co-ops um, in this space. So an honor to be here. Did I leave anything out, Baba? Uh, well, there's lots, lots more. We'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> conversation. Uh, but over the last two decades, there's been a tremendous rise in what some people call the food movement in the United States. There's been an uh, increasing awareness about the role that food plays in creating a just society and also an increasing awareness of the 
damage that the current industrial food system is doing to the environment. Um, so in the context of this rise of the food movement, why is there a need for a national Black Food and Justice Alliance? And how did that come about? Mm. Well, I'm going to actually invite you to answer that question with me. Um, so let's let's be in, in conversation together about answering that question. But I'll say um, many things. One is, um, you know, to be candid, um, there there is a need for um, Black people to be organized 100%. We um, uh, can and should engage in the larger global struggle um, for food sovereignty, for land justice. And inside of that, it's really important that we understand the context, the conditions that particularly face Black communities specifically. I will say that the industrial ag system, as we know, actually has very deep roots in being very specifically anti-Black. There are there's all kinds of policies and legislation that specifically targets Black communities. Um, and we would be remiss if we were to approach those policies and the system with this colorblind approach. Um, and so we have to be specific because uh, the system has been specific in targeting us. And we have to be specific in our response and also in our imaginations for what's possible for us. It doesn't mean we're narrow and we only care about Black people, right? It's Black Lives Matters, right? And that doesn't negate all, you know, other people and communities. Um, and we and we have always been and will continue to be intentional about understanding our communities, the plight of our communities inside of the global struggle um, for dignity, for self-determination and for the rights of our people worldwide. And so, uh, so it's critical that we have a space where we understand what is happening to us and also are inside of collective conversations and strategies together to address um, what our community specifically need and deserve. What would you say, Baba? Yeah, I would add to that that one of the things that I think led to the forming of the National Black Food and Justice Alliance was our analysis that we specifically need to be building power for Black people. That's right. That even within the context of food justice organizations that are white led, that still we have this problem of the vast majority of people who are identified as white in American society, having not really examined how they fit into the system of white supremacy, how they unintentionally perpetuate it, how they show up with what I call white arrogance, uh, white privilege and white fragility. And so our, our work is really you know, to figure out primarily how do we extract our communities from this extractive economy that we find ourselves in and this disempowered situation that we find ourselves in and to promote self-determination. So our primary work is not really to figure out how do we reform white people and how do we you know, get inside of white organizations and help white organizations to, to, to see the world in a more just way. Our work primarily is to organize black people to build the power that we need to exhibit self-determination. So I think that analysis uh, distinguishes the National Black Food and Justice Alliance from, uh, from many people who might be black who are doing work that is food justice related work, but aren't explicitly building power for black people. Yeah, let me riff on that too. Um, so yes, to everything you said. And there's something I, I meant to say earlier too about how white supremacy shows up in the food movement and amongst our organizations. And what white supremacy teaches is that whiteness is um, the top, is the, the lead, is the, 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 you know, that white people get the unearned privilege of being able to lead and have um, a say in the, the direction, you know? Um, and <clears throat> um, at the top, I heard a, a number um, on a call I was on the other day that says 8% of uh, nonprofits are headed by um, PLCs, um, people of color. So only 8%, so that leaves us to what, 92% I'm gonna deduce that nonprofits, now I need to check that number, but judging from my own experience in the food movement and different nonprofit spaces, when we see a saturation of white leadership, um, it's an unearned, unearned privilege that white people have assumed in, in space to be the lead, to be the director, to be um, the spokesperson, to be the decider. Um, and it is, it, is, it is way past time to shift that. You know, we need to assume our rightful place, those of us 
who are deeply impacted by this food system, who are deeply impacted by injustice, and those of us also who have deep imaginations and brilliance and insight. It is our time to lead this movement. And so the National Black Food and Justice Alliance um, was founded uh, in collaboration with other movements too, Heal Food Alliance. We've been in you know, relationship with many other formations um, to make sure that uh, you know, our folks assume our rightful place as leaders in this movement. And in order to do so, we need the space, we need the time uh, and the energy together to be organized. And that includes making sure that we have a space to do so. Yes, so absolutely, I agree with you, it's 100%. And in addition to this centering of white people as the assumed leaders of every damn thing, um, the logic of capitalism then begins to concentrate resources in the hands of those same right. And so it becomes a self-replicating system because the people who, because of this unearned privilege are in leadership positions and are more visible, are thus better positioned to get more funding. And not just because they're, um, white, but also because they tend to be in the same social circles often with funders. Maybe they went to the same college. Maybe they go to the same social events. They speak the same way. They kind of move through the world in a very similar fashion. And so money tends to be concentrated in the hands of those leaders. And mm -hmm. so what we find is that then when it comes time to, let's say, apply for grants, that those who are considered to be uh, more well-positioned or have the capacity, which is the word often used in the nonprofit uh, fuck shit industrial complex, um, they have greater capacity and so thus they get greater funding. And so it becomes a self-replicating kind of closed loop system almost. And so absolutely for us, we need to step out of that and assert our right to self-determination and the National Black Food and Justice Alliance is certainly a vehicle for doing that. That's right. So let's talk a bit about the history. When did the Alliance start? Yeah, so we started, you know, the Alliance um, formally started in uh, 2015, uh, but it, it, and also I'm going to invite you to add on to the, to the um, founding history of the Alliance as a co-founder um, yourself, but uh, it, it grew out of a lot of initiatives um, and conversations and energy um, in a lot of different spaces. I'll say from my vantage point, um, it was the Bugs conference spaces, uh, Black farmers, urban gardeners, where um, we would convene folks uh, all around the country. And always on Sunday, we would strategize um, together in Black space at the Bugs conference to say, you know, Black farmers, Black organizers, we need an agenda, we need a place, um, a container, a, not a container, but um, and some infrastructure to be able to actualize our collective freedom dreams. And so um, about 2015, um, I'm not sure when that call, I actually um, wanna lift up that call that I think, you know, that Beatrice Beckford um, hosted amongst food leaders around the country to talk about what does, you know, this was actually during the Ferguson uprising. So I, I would say 2015, um, and we were we were asking ourselves, you know, with the, the rise of attention in police violence, people talk about the rise in police violence, and that's not true. It's the rise of attention um, around, say that again. I say the rise of people with camera phones to capture it. Right, 100%. We've always had cop watch, shout out to um, Malcolm X grassroots movement and other formations who, you know, have been um, sounding the alarm around police violence. Um, and so called together uh, leaders to say, you know, what does the food movement mean in this time? And so I remember that conversation and it stuck with me. Um, and uh, I will share, you know, I was in a um, BOLD, which is Black Organizing for Leadership and Dignity training program and Beatrice Beckford was in the same program. Um, and we had an activity where we were asking what's our, um, I forgot what it's called off the top of my head, but it's basically your commitment. What, what are you committed to? Um, and mine was, I'm a commitment to building eco-affirming, healthy Black self-determination. Uh, and I asked her if she was interested in building out something. Um, and she was enthusiastic about it. And we, we, we approached the one and only uh, Malik Yakini, 
um, to see, you know, what we could what we could launch together. Um, and so that's that's how I entered this. And I can go into how we formally launched at St. Hel or at Penn Center in St. Helena in 2016. But um, but what's your what's your entry point into this? Well, you know, I'll say that uh, even so. Again, yes, affirming everything you said, and um, you know, the Bugs Conference had been this gathering place. And while we gather there each year, we, many people were interested in how do we have sustained collective action in between the conferences. Mm -hmm. And so there had actually been a couple of kind of conversations and false starts to try to create some national container for radical black food justice work. And I'll just, without going into detail, just say none of those really materialized, but the National Black Food and Justice Alliance did. And so, um, I, I will shout out one of those though that the, the one that that worked this food black food sovereignty, I think it was Alliance. I can't remember the name of it, but they were really supportive in in helping us too to make sure we had the list serves and the people who were interested to kind of carry some of some of that into um, the at least institutional memory of the alliance. So, so the, I, I look at the alliance as a continuation of various. Yes. iterations of trying to bring black people together around the food movement and so Absolutely. yeah and even even within i think the larger black liberation movement this idea of being more self-reliant in terms of food has been a an ongoing thread there's been 100%. many organizations that have had uh, either agricultural projects or what we might now call food justice projects mm -hmm. they framed within the larger context of the black liberation movement mm -hmm. uh, so let's let's talk more about the national black food and justice alliance where it is now, what programs it offers, and how this work of organizing Black food cooperatives fits within that larger context. Okay, beautiful. Well, let me share my screen. Can I do that? Can I, can I share a little presentation and walk y'all through some things? Yeah, I wish you could DJ today. You know, people don't know that you <laughs> I'm, I'm a, I had an alter ego. Yeah, maybe they'll, maybe they'll get to see that some other time. That's next time, next time. Y'all got to invite me as a DJ next time. So, all right. Can you see my screen? Yeah. All right. Excellent. All right. So the Black, the National Black Food and Justice Alliance. Check out our new logo. Um, shout out to our new comms lead, uh, Leanne uh, Morissette, for leading that. Um, but I want to start with um, just something about the alliance that is near and dear to me, which is the fact that we are intergenerational brilliance. Um, and so from, I think when we first started, our youngest was 18 and oldest was in 70s. So from 18 to 70s, you know, we've always tried to hold the intergenerational brilliance of our, our people. Um, and that's an incredible value of ours. And so we launched, this is a picture here of Randolph Carr and Savvy Horn, where we launched in St. Helena. Um, at Penn Center um, in 2016. And you can see all the stickies in the background because we've, we've been doing a lot of work over the years, mapping what's going on amongst black people, um, seeing what our freedom dreams are, uh, building out uh, and weaving together what that looks like. And so over the years, we've built um, a leadership team, we've built committees, that have now um, materialized into some concrete program that we're, we're working on together. This, uh, this picture here is, um, we convene uh, our members every year and last year, and, ev and mostly every year we can. We always convene on Black land. Uh, and last year it was at uh, Franklinton Center uh, in North Carolina. So uh, when we convene, we typically have evening hours of shenanigans and fun things um, and spiritual things like sharing stories over a fire and freedom dreaming together. And so, um, so just, I'm gonna go through just quickly some of our programs, um, program areas of focus uh, today uh, because we have a lot going on and it's exciting. We have been listening to, working with, strategizing together. Y'all, I have thousands of reams of butcher paper from, um, okay, that's, that's, that sounds not terribly earth friendly, but there are a lot of ideas that have been surfaced um, that we have formed into some consolidated work together. Um, and so the self-determining food economies is one work area. 
um, and land justice is another work area. So those are our two primary work areas of focus. It's around building self-determining food economies, which Baba, Baba Malik, I'm gonna actually ask you in a second to tell us what that means. Um, and then um, the land justice, because we cannot do this work without land justice. Um, it has materialized into what we know as black land and power. We're also leading policy work together um, we've launched a mutual aid resource council where we're making sure that members are driving resources back to our, our members. Um, we launched a Black academics arm of the Alliance. These are Black people in the academy, mostly working on food studies, food justice studies. Um, I'll talk about a little bit about that in a second, and then arts and culture that we've um, that we've launched. Um, so, Baba Malik, can you tell us what, what we mean by self-determining food economies and, and why? What is this? So, so because of the history of uh, segregation, discrimination, and unequal disbursement of power in American society, Black people generally find ourselves in um, kind of in centers of population density. We tend to live in communities with each other. Not always, but the most dense Black populations are in places like New York like Brooklyn and, and Detroit and Chicago and LA and Atlanta, where we have these large black communities. And what we find in these communities is that the food is being supplied by others other than black folks. And the folks who are making mega millions off of that food are other than black folks. And so we find ourselves in the midst of an extractive capitalist economy, which is extracting the wealth from our communities that we spend on food. And consequently, that wealth is not being circulated within our communities to create ownership, to create employment, to create healthy, vibrant communities, and to create empowerment. And so our effort to build self-determining food economies kind of focuses in two main areas. One has been on the retail level of building food co-ops. And while we think that Black businesses in general can be an important strategy in strengthening Black e uh, economies, we think that the cooperative model is really the best model that we can adopt because it provides for broad ownership as opposed to individual Black people who might own businesses and might do well. And maybe if they're somewhat conscious, might find ways that the larger Black community benefits, or maybe not, because someone owns a Black business doesn't necessarily mean the Black community as a whole benefits from that. So the cooperative model provides for broad ownership and broad collective advancement. And so we're totally committed to that. So that's one aspect of the self-determining food economies work to begin to capture some of that retail dollar and to build the infrastructure within our communities so that we can control the retail food economy. But then there's another side to it. And that's the side dealing with farmers and developing supply chains. And you know, I, I've kind of reduced this and sometimes my mind is not real complex. So the, the, this idea might be more complex than that, but I've reduced it to trying to figure out how do we get black grown food to black plates? How do we figure out how to get things that are grown by black farmers, move them through all the processes that are necessary for them to finally end up on the plates of black consumers? How do we, how do, we do for ourselves? I think is really the, the main thing that we're trying to figure out in the self-determining food economies work. Beautiful, thank you for that. <clears throat> and uh, you, I realize I forgot a bullet point, so apologies and thank you for filling that in. Um, connect, I connect the supply chain to the food co-op um, movement work that you all have been leading, that we've been leading. Um, and just to note, you know, a lot of this came about because some of our members were starting a food co-op or had already started a food co-op. And we thought it was important for folks to have the space to um, share and grow and learn and build together. And so really excited to see and continue to see where it's growing out to be. Um, Who's that handsome guy in that photo, Dar? That is Baba Fred Carter <laughs> from Black Oak Center for Sustainable Renewable Living. Um, and I, I chose this photo because the first time that I thought about self-determining food economies actually came out of a conversation where uh, Mama Santua Harris 
uh, Baba Fred, Mama Jafunza, we were all at your house in Detroit and we were talking about a regional food economy, a local food economy that was resilient. Um, and that's that was when in my mind, it was kind of crystallized what, what we were talking about as the self-determining food economy. Um, the other thing I'll say is um, shout out to Dr. Jazz who has been leading hey, our, our <laughs> um, name for those who might not know. Dr. Jazz Ratliff, uh, recent PhD uh, graduate of Tuskegee. Um, and <laughs> she's amazing, uh, I can tell you that. She's brilliant and a go-getter. And we are so, so, so lucky to have her as a part of the team now for the National Black Food and Justice Alliance. Um, and so she's been leading, well, she's leading all of this work now with us, um, but also has been specifically leading our mapping work, um, which I highly encourage people to go to our website, blackfoodjustice.org and check out the food map directory. Uh, I'm not going to dare to click on this link because I don't trust my tech skills. So I'm going to keep it moving so we can move, move through this. Um, I mentioned some of the things, this is Tanya Fields from the um, uh, Black Feminist Project in New York uh, at one of our recent convenings too. And these pictures come from Carlton Turner, SIP Culture. So shout out to Carlton, who's so deeply committed to capturing and share and storytelling um, with arts and culture. Um, but we are engaged in policy work together. We think it's really important that we drive our own policy agenda. Now we seek very radical change, um, but we will use all the tools necessary to do what we need to do for our communities, including working uh, around policy. Uh, and we think it's important that we set our own policy agenda. We get approached to sign on to many things and we do if we feel like it, it, it makes sense, um, but it's really important that we lead that. And so some of the things that we're engaged in um, that you'll see coming up is the red, black, and green New Deal with the movement for Black Lives. You all saw the introduction of the Justice for Black Farmers Act, um, and then ongoing convenings around what a collective member-led agenda, a uh, policy agenda looks like, um, which in uh, which we believe should always include something relating back to uh, reparations. Um, and so, so definitely stay tuned for that. You see here, Dr. Monica White, author of Freedom Farmers, who is actually the founding um, uh, member of Black Academics, the research arm of uh, the National Black Food and Justice Alliance. Uh, we've been working on building archives, making sure that you know, just the knowledge like Carter G. Woodson papers and just all the things that people have access to in universities are available to our people who are committed to growing food and passing on knowledge. And so they're building out an archives um, and we're partnering with um, various HBCUs uh, in 1890 institutions. So we're really excited about that work. Uh, I'm gonna skip ahead just to the land really quickly. Um, which is our Black land and power work, which is really important to know about. Um, well, let me back up too, because we do have to shout out uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, who says, in order for any people uh, or nation to survive, land is necessary. Um, and it should be known that we are rooted in Black self-determination and sovereignty and we are committed to building relationships with indigenous communities too, because we believe um, in their right to sovereignty and self-determination as well. Um, and we are not inside of privatizing land um, nor competing for land. And we believe that um, there needs, there can be justice for all of our communities and has to be. Um, so our, our agenda is rooted in building fighting and launching a fund. Um, and so we are building a network of community land stewards. Um, we are fighting, um, launching an organizing campaign, starting with three cities, Baltimore, uh, Chicago area, uh, and Jackson, Mississippi to launch some organizing campaigns around uh, community land. Uh, and we've launched a fund that is, and uh, will be governed by what we're creating called the resource Commons Council. And that's important to know. Uh, you'll hear me talk about governance a lot because we can't talk about self-determination if we're not in the practice of governance um, and learning and sharpening our ability to govern ourselves. And so that is um, that is the, the, the land work. And then just briefly, 
there is a, um, a lot of work being done in our comms and culture um, arm, basically with under the leadership of Leanne Morissette um, and Randolph Carr, just helping to support our members with opportunities for funding, training, media support, amplification. Um, there are all kinds of workshops that we'll be leading around um, and working also with the Movement for Black Lives around media trainings for people who need that um, storytelling support. Uh, we get approached by a lot of media and we try to share that with members. So if folks are interested in sharing the microphone, by all means, uh, Leanne will be developing um, some trainings and a digital toolkit for folks. Also working on a wellness initiative for our people because we have to be well in this work and take care of each other and ourselves. Hey, who, uh, who, 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 who that in that picture we just passed? Not that one, not that one. Yeah, who that? This is Ella Baker. <laughs> you wanna say something about Ella Baker? Oh, you wanna, I just see you got on your presentation. Who is that? Well, this is actually Leanne's presentation, but I do think it's important um, always to lift up, lift up Ella Baker. Ella Baker actually was deeply involved in cooperative work. Um, and is my model for how uh, she worked to organize with young people, understanding their brilliance, their insight, and their ability to actually lead. And so I definitely um, take my cues and have learned a lot around Ella Baker over the years. Is there something you wanted to say about Ella Baker? Well, just in many ways, uh, the mother of the modern uh, civil rights movement, uh, really an unsung hero. This has not gotten the recognition right. that she deserves and trained uh, many of the organizers who went on to start SNCC and other organizations. That's right. And also, you had you got lots of pictures of Fannie Lou Hamer. Why? <laughs> um, you derailing me from my presentation, but Fannie Lou Hamer also, um, <laughs> who was one of our earliest models, um, and uh, she rose around community land stewardship um, from Freedom Farm uh, Cooperative built uh, in Mississippi. Um, spokesperson, I think, or head of the uh, Mississippi, uh, what is it, the Democratic Party. Thank you, Mississippi Democratic Party. Um, and yeah, for so many reasons, but she's Freedom Democratic Party. Thank you. Um, but she's, um, she's absolutely important in our, um, in our lineage. Uh, we do all these things that we do, because of the shoulders that we stand on, um, which 100% is, is, is folks like Fannie Lou Hamer um, and Ella Baker. Also, you know, just to point out, you know, we typically hear a lot about men in the civil rights movement and in the radical black tradition, but we don't get to hear about the women who organized and who have done so much. And so in the Alliance, we try to make sure that we're, we're lifting that up because it's, it's an incomplete story, incomplete history. And we do ourselves injustice if we don't lift up the women, the leadership of women, um, also including queer and trans, um, and gender non-conforming comrades in the movement as well. And so we, we are very intentional about that in all of our efforts. Anything else you wanna say here before I go on? I want to show a little quick clip from no, Leanne. Not yet. I'll interrupt you later. Okay. <laughs> but Leanne Morissette is a brilliant documentary and I wanted to, uh, filmmaker, and she did a documentary um, or, or some shorts for SAFON, one of our member organ founding member organizations, Southeastern African American Farmers Organic Network. So I just wanna leave y'all with just a couple of seconds from her uh, film to really encourage people to go check it out because it's also what's possible and what we're building inside of the Alliance is how we tell our own stories. So this Back is- to some really uh, basic ways of living because I think we have ran out of ideas on how to improve our life and we need to just go back to the basics. I always tell people it's, I've, I've worked in nonprofit, I've worked in corporate, I've worked retail. This is by far the hardest thing I've ever done and the most rewarding and filling thing. We've come so detached from a part of us, like a part of, of us as Black people. We've always been growers. We've always been, and, and I'm not ashamed of, of, of that. So why not hone in on a skill that has been generational for us? 
I grew up understanding that the land feeds you and it takes care of you. And so that's what I was brought up within. And that has been always the historical context of this farm is to take care of the families. How do you grow within your yard or how do you produce food, fruit, and herbs, and fiber, and all of those things, because those are the things that we need to sustain ourselves. Thank you for indulging me here. I think this is, um, I wanted to include this because as a part of the co-op space, um, it's really important that, you know, we see Black leadership um, in terms of the co-op retail space but also where our food comes from. The sourcing of our food in these co-op spaces is critical. And so um, it's, it's important that we provide a pathway to make sure that we are purchasing from, supporting, investing in black farmers um, and land stewards. And so I wanted to end with that there. Okay, that's it for me. I mean, here's our contact info, but. And let people write these down if they want to. And the, the main thing is get the web address. If you don't write anything else down, get that www.blackfoodjustice.org down and you can contact us and find out about the mighty work of the mighty National Black Food and Justice Alliance led by the mighty executive director, Dara Cooper. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Dara, for that overview. Appreciate it greatly. Um, so I've got a few questions for you. One. Uh -oh. Sometimes, you know, food co-ops are per perceived as being a white thing. And I think in many of our communities, at least I'll speak from my own, own experience, I saw the emergence of food co-ops come in the kind of 1970s as part of the primarily white counterculture movement. And so sometimes co food co-ops are still perceived as being these kind of white elite spaces where black people are not welcome and that that's kind of not our thing. I, I wonder, if, what are your reflections on that? Yeah, this is why I'm so um, excited about uh, and uh, deeply interested in this space you all are creating here. Um, I think about uh, Dr. Jessica Gordon M. Hart's incredible um, work called Collective Courage, the History of African-American Cooperatives. I think about what I just mentioned or who I just mentioned, Fannie Lou Hamer and the cooperative work and Ella Baker, W.B. Du Bois. I think about um, the, um, the, the long history, uh, the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, you know, the long history that our communities can draw on um, that we have always uh, been in cooperative spaces. Uh, Dr. Nemhart argues that, you know, um, Black people have always been left out of the, the, we've never benefited from the capitalist economy. In fact, um, as my comrade said the other day, you know, we were the capital. Um, and so, um, so, shout out to Heber Brown. Um, and so, you know, uh, we have to have a critical understanding of capitalism um, and understand the history of the many, many, many um, explorations, experiments, bodies of work that our communities have always been inside of. Um, and, you know, to, to white colleagues, you know, it's, it's your responsibility to lift that up too. Um, and so this whiteness, this co-optation of um, of co-ops of, and then, you know, I'm just saying food movement overall too, you know, we have this ongoing debate about whether or not kale um, is, is black food or avocado toast and all this stuff. Anyway, that's, that's a tangent. I'm saying reclaim it because <laughs> I grew up in it. I also read something from uh, Dr. Harris that said that black people have always uh, uh, grown kale in our, in our gardens. Um, and so anyway, all of that to say, I think it's our responsibility to reclaim spaces that we've always been in. In fact, in some cases have created. So like the community land trust work in this country, quite frankly, formalized 
out of SNCC in Albany, Georgia. So shout out to the charades who are still holding it down. Um, but New Communities is one of the first examples we know of community land trust. Now you go to a community land trust conference, you'll see all white faces. Um, and people forget that the roots actually were in black communities um, in Geechee communities. You know, we have all kinds of examples of black people building cooperatives around our food, around our land, around our needs. Um, so it's important to continue that space. You know, I want to lift up that the great anti-lynching crusader, uh, Ida Wells, actually wrote her first article, her first anti-lynching article, as a result of the lynching of the three operators of the People's Grocery, a right. cooperative in Memphis. That's and right. so just, you know, to, to kind of tie in this cooperative work to the larger anti-racist work and the larger work of building Black self-determination, this has been a tool historically that we have used even prior to enslavement ending, uh, many would argue we had these uh, mutual aid societies, if you will, or various ways of cooperating that weren't formally cooperatives, but they really cooperatives are our way. It's baked into our culture. It's baked into the way that we move through the world, both prior to our enslavement, during our enslavement to the extent we were able to, and immediately afterwards. So a uh, co-op is definitely not a white thing. It's really part of, of Black culture. That's right. Uh, what types of organizations are members of the National Black Food and Justice Alliance? Not, you know, not naming all of them, but, you know, are they farmers? Are they policy yep. people? Who, who joins the alliance? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll, I'll share that. And then I want to kick the last question to you since we're, we're at time. Um, I, I'm going to tell you my question so you can think about it for a second as I answer your question. Um, my question to you is... You have been so committed to um, institution building in so many different capacities, um, but you have been a, 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 a incredibly strong anchor in this food movement. Um, and so I'm super curious to you, um, A, why? What, what has kept you in this work for so long? Um, and what have been your wildest freedom dreams around this? What, what, what is possible if we come together and realize our greatest potential? So that's my question to you. Um, Hmm. I'll be thinking about that while I listen. All right. To All right. So the members of the alliance um, range from yes, farmers, farmer groups, land stewards, um, to uh, co-ops, dis uh, distribution folks working in distributions. So folks working all along the food system. Um, we also have capacity partners, um, folks who help to train uh, organizers um, because organizing is really important. Um, uh, building out. Again, we've, we started building out what's called cultivator members, um, which are largely first to start with our black academics arm. So these, these folks aren't necessarily in organizations, but we believe everybody should have a political home um, and including academics. Um, and so the Alliance has become a political home to many um, researchers as well. So um, from again, uh, farmer organizations to land stewards to, um, local local gardens local growers you know we do ask to be considered as an organization that you are serving a community that you are comprised of multiple decision makers um, that it is not just one individual and so um, so we have a range but uh, but our condition is that you are committed to our our values our shared values um, which is, um, and, and then that you are at least 70% um, black led, so. All right, thank you. And for people who wanna join again, they can go to our website, which is www.blackfoodjustice.org. So you yeah. asked me this like complex multi-layer question. <laughs> I did. I'll make an attempt to respond to that. And say that first of all, I am inspired continually by our ancestors. Uh, both those who we share collectively, and you know, we know many of those names that are in textbooks and many names that are not in textbooks, but that we may be poor during libations and community ceremonies. But there's all these other folks that aren't in the textbooks and whose names aren't widely known and including in our personal bloodlines. So there are people in my personal bloodline that I am tremendously inspired by who built against all odds. And so, when I, when I look at the tremendous things they were able to do without the use of the technology that we now have access to and without uh, 
kind of all of the things that give us access to knowledge, all kinds of knowledge that they couldn't have possibly known in the past. I'm tremendously inspired about the possibilities of what we can do. Also, I have either the fortune or misfortune, depending on how you look at it, as being what some people call a true believer, that I just really believe that Black people will be free and that we can be free and that it's our responsibility to be free and that capitulation is not an option. And so we really have no choice but to, to build for our own sovereignty and self-determination. And so just that belief, you know, which maybe is summarized in, in the words by Dr. King when he said the arc of the universe builds a fence towards justice, I truly believe that. Or, you know, in ancient Kemetic philosophy, they talked about the principles of ma'at or balance. I think that there is balance in the universe and that, you know, that which is right ultimately uh, overpowers that which is wrong. And so because I firmly believe that, I, I just can't see anything but victory for Black people and a cooperative, non-capitalist economy operating uh, in our communities in the future. I think it's important that we have dreams and visions that go beyond the current capitalist and white supremacist society and see us as being sovereigns where we're actually governing ourselves and that we have an economy that benefits our communities while not working in opposition to the rest of humanity or destroying the environment. So Dara, I wanna thank you so much. It's always great to be in conversation with you. I wanna thank you. Uh, we wanna thank Dr. Jazz, who is behind that logo that you see behind the National Black Freedom and Justice Alliance logo, who has been handling the technical portion of this recording and also has been doing much of the organizing for Black Led Day. We're so appreciative of her and also Sister Soraya, who's on the staff of the Alliance, who's also been doing much of that behind the scenes work. We also wanna thank those of you who joined us and encourage you to stay tuned for the rest of Black Led Day. We have more uh, tremendously powerful and empowering presentations which will take place for the rest of the day. And then this evening we have a social event which we invite you to, to join as well. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody.